Even the lowest animal has a fear of death. Insects will scurry away from danger when they perceive it. Only human beings are capable of overcoming this fear and accepting death. And the ancient world of paganism was full of people who accomplished this. Caesar said that the Celts were fearless in battle because they believed in reincarnation. And in my videos I've demonstrated that similar beliefs existed among the Slavs and Germanic peoples, and of course everyone knows Indian people, uh, Hindus, Buddhists believe in that too. I've lost loved ones before their time, and I understand that grief is a heavy weight to bear. And many people will try and rationalize these ancient beliefs as merely a kind of cope, a way of coping with grief. But the problem with that is that grief is a way to cope with the loss of someone. And the belief that they've reincarnated doesn't change that. You still lost them in your life. They're not coming back into your life. So if this was invented as a form of consolation to cope with grief, it's not very good. Uh, it makes no difference to the reality of loss in someone's life. So I don't really accept that uh, explanation at all. If we are to reduce the beliefs of our venerable ancestors to mere cultural adaptations and merely to consider their efficacy in that context, then I don't think it makes sense to describe reincarnation as a cultural adaptation for coping with grief. Uh, rather, if it copes with anything, it's with fear, fear of death. If you believe that you have lived a life before this one, and you shall live others after this one, then it puts your life into a grander context. In this context, what is important is to live gloriously and leave behind an honorable name when you die. Yet even within the aforementioned cultures, fear of death still predominates in most people. Of course, women and children, uh, and the majority of men too, with the exception of some warriors, uh, would still naturally fear death just as any animal would. So whatever religion and culture you come from, you can be forgiven for not wanting to die. Uh, it's perfectly natural to fear death. But what if you took this infantile, animal-like fear of death uh, and tried to transform it into an ideology, into a philosophy? That's what I think transhumanism is. Transhumanism ultimately sees death as an obstacle and one which can be overcome through technology. The popular author Yuval Harari, whose work has been praised by Bill Gates and Barack Obama, and his books are for sale in the UN headquarters, uh, he's promoted by the World Economic Forum too. He's a transhumanist and he believes in a transhumanist future. But he also believes that the state ought to be reorientated to an ethical system based entirely on pain and pleasure, with pleasure as a synonym for the ultimate good. I'm speaking of both mental and physical pleasure. These to him are the only real forms of good, and the fictions, as he calls them, that other societies have been based on uh, are not really good. People like him and the organizations with which he's affiliated are trying to construct a new world view for a new society, uh, which combines things like Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism uh, and the idea of the panopticon with a kind of neo-gnosticism, which sees the material non-cyber realm as as bad as something to be escaped from. Uh, and it looks towards data and technology and an online existence, a cyber kind of existence as, as an inevitable and desirable future for mankind in which more pleasure will be derived for a greater number of people. Some people call it fully automated luxury Gnosticism. It's basically the panopticon, but with porn. The reactionary French author, Joseph de Maistre, who uh, opposed the French Revolution, foresaw the ultimate 
goal of left-wing thought, uh, even in his time, as the death of death, a war on death itself. He said, the whole earth, perpetually steeped in blood, is nothing but a vast altar upon which all that is living must be sacrificed without end, without measure, without pause, until the consummation of things, until evil is extinct, until the death of death. So whilst Harari and his kind see the ancient religions such as paganism as mere fiction and mortality as an obstacle which needs to be overcome, our ancestors in pagan times, in pagan cultures, took the opposite view. For example, within the Platonic pagan path of theurgy, as described by Iamblichus, mortality is the only route we have to immortality. So it's not through computers or artificial intelligence that we will transcend our mortal lives, but rather through mortality itself, because the immortality of the human soul is expressed through the particular form of our mortal existence. For, so for we pagans, the eternal nature of the soul is what links us to the divine. The Christians took this belief and changed it slightly so that they are linked to the divine through the incarnation of the divine in a mortal form who uh, is executed and therefore redeems mankind. The objective of Iamblichus's Platonic theurgy was assimilation with the gods, but this can only be achieved through the material, natural realm, and it's the cycles of nature and the material realm and the daimons, as the Greeks say, the beings that govern this world of matter, which connect us to the world of the gods. And in our Germanic paganism, we have similar beings, the daimons, we have the fulgia, who connect us to our ancestors, and the, the land whites, as people say, like the, the spirits of nature. All these things are placated, whether they be elves or whites or whatever, or ancestors. And they, in turn, link us to the divine realm, to the gods, the highest. And our ultimate goal is to, whether we reincarnate uh, as a descendant or whether we will somehow become assimilated with the gods, uh, perhaps in the form of Valhall, where we join the highest god of all, Odin. Ultimately, though, death is the path that we must take. It is a desirable end that helps us to join the divine. And Christians share that view with us, and many other world religions do too. But the popular materialist view has rejected the idea of gods and an afterlife, and is attempting to appropriate bits of Gnosticism, bits of Buddhism, uh, and a, a rabid technophilia, combining them to make this I mean, belief in salvation through technology and the integration of man into a non-physical space or a cyberspace of pure data. They expect perhaps that this data will become conscious and will be a god. Having believed, convinced themselves that there are no gods, they now have sought to create a god. But of course, a god is not merely data and uh, it's such a flimsy worldview, I can't believe it's so popular. This question of mortality is going to be addressed in my next video, which is all about Indo-European conceptions of the afterlife, of underworld and of reincarnation, and of the world tree which links all the different realms. The conflict between these two worldviews will be discussed at the forthcoming Pagan Futures Conference later this month. You can find details and links to where you can buy tickets in the description. I will be speaking there on this topic and trying to explain why our views as polytheists, as pagans, whether Platonist or otherwise, require an engagement with the natural world, require an engagement with our ancestral position, our relation in the context of our ancestors, 
require uh, an acknowledgement of our position in the natural cycles of the year and our environment regionally from which we arose and require an acceptance of death, death as a desirable end and a necessary uh, prerequisite for our ultimate objectives of becoming either assimilated with the gods or reincarnated uh, through our descendants. These beliefs which we hold dear and are essential to our religious worldview are incompatible with this new proposed religion of certain elite peoples. And it is essential that we assert our position so that we're able to ensure that the future, whatever it may hold, will contain space for people who hold our beliefs. If we don't assert them, we can't expect anyone to recognize these beliefs. And so it's really important we come together and agree on this. Therefore, you need to come hear me speak in London and also hear the speech of my colleague, Dr. Borja Villalonga, who is also an expert in this field, particularly the intersection of uh, pagan religion and modernity. And you will have a chance to participate during a Q&A session where you can ask uh, Dr. Villalonga any questions or me any questions you have about this. And we can hopefully begin a dialogue, not just between ourselves about what are the most essential beliefs we hold dear as pagans, but also with other religious groups and with the political power structures which claim to defend the plurality of religious beliefs in this country. Uh, because I'm not convinced that they really are interested in preserving our, the integrity of our religion. Uh, I think we've got to make sure that we assert what our religion stands for. And this is the crucial time that this has to happen. So please join me in London at the Pagan Futures Conference this month.